Soar Optimus. So Soar for sister and, and Optimus. And they're a global professional women's organization. And they were everywhere. They had, you know, 80 delegates. They had, <laughs> they had projects everywhere. They were very active globally for, for women's rights and, and the rights of, well, the rights of women and girls. So um, the UN doesn't differentiate because, the, you know, the problems start pretty young in, in countries where um, when you become 12, you are considered a woman and then you're shuttered away, basically. You can't go to school, you can't be on the street, you can't you know, do, do anything without the approval of a man. So, um, so those are the three main types of events that went on at, at, the, at the summit. Um, and the Servos put on its first parallel event, so we've been getting more and more involved. They started going about six years ago, and then COVID happened. And this was the first one that's in person again since COVID. And the great thing about the parallel events post-COVID are some of them, about half of them, are still virtual. And I thought actually that was a better way to do it for the parallel events because we were getting to meet with people all over the world directly. Not only you know people in the NGOs themselves, but the people that they were helping and um, streaming in. And most of these people could not get on a plane and go to New York City, obviously. Um, so, so I thought that that was actually an effective way, and I believe that they're going to continue to give that option for the parallel events. Um, I actually wish that some of the side events were also. Um, they did some hybrid where they were in person, but they were, they were also streamed. And, um, we had a lot of technical issues with that, so that was interesting. But so, so those are the, yeah, and, and it's, it's an immense thing to go to the United Nations. And um, one of my personal memories was I, I was sitting in um, in conference room four, which abuts the General Assembly room and is as big. And there was a big event going on, and somebody from Korea was speaking, so we had our translators, and th th there are these like weird plastic things that you hang on your hang on your and I think these are original to the building when it was completed in the 60s, right? And I remember seeing that as a kid on TV cause, and asking my older sister, like, what is that? Um, there's a wire and she's like, oh, th that's a translation. They're hearing the speech in their own language. I'm like, oh, that's interesting. I'd like to do that someday. <laughs> and there I was, I was like, hey. <laughs> So, so that was a, an interesting full circle for me, you know, coming from that wish when I was 10 years old to, you know, at 61, being able to be there and take part. So, um, so the uh, Secretary General in his opening statement said that um, gains are being erased. That was the, the overview of the whole conference. They're being erased and they're being erased really rapidly. And then the side events, we got to see all this, the numbers and statistics the parallel events, we got to hear people working in all these different areas. And then there were side meetups where you got to meet and discuss your point of view of the issues. So one of my best memories of the summit was I was at this um, meta-sponsored meetup. So this was, um, the theme was technology and innovation. So. They talked about the problems with technology, but also some of the solutions. And I ended up going into a deep dive conversation with the um, ambassador from Sweden to Yemen about the situation because the UN format was, you know, they talked a lot about STEM, which is you know, getting more girls involved in, in the STEM program. But the reality after listening to the reports and different conversations was that the problem, um, particularly in Europe, is there are something like 34 million migrants and refugees coming into countries where the, where the women and girls aren't allowed to go to school. They're, they don't speak the language, they have no job skills or education. And how do they integrate them into structures that are super functional but not for that type of scenario? Um, and so we had a big conversation about how to, how to connect with and help these populations because it's the majority of the populations coming into these countries. 
and and um, there's a problem where some governments will cloister migrants together so that they feel like they have community, but that actually isolates the women and girls, and they can live their life out and never leave the community, and that's actually a big problem socially. So and for their integration into into a, a new place that they're living. So there was a lot of conversations about solutions to that. One of the big things that was also covered in the conference is, you know, the internet's a funny thing. We could have created anything, but we created the world that we already exist in and worse. So there are new problems with cyber stalking and cyber harassment that are really um, brutal and significant and and there were some technological ways to deal with it. So for example, when I went to the Meta Meetup, they had all of these you know, technology booths set up and um, about educating people you know, in their homes, providing them with, with internet and computers. And, and um, one, of the th one of their solutions for anonymity and protection from cyber stalking for women and girls was avatars. So you'd sign up, say, for a, for a technology course, and um, you would create an avatar and a name for that avatar. And so the school you know, knows that it's you that's getting the credit for it. But when you're actually studying, or your whole presence online is this creation, so you have kind of a wall of anonymity. And I thought that was a very interesting technological yeah. mm -hmm. solution. The other thing that they're doing is hashtag take it down. So if you type that into a post, the computer algorithm finds it and takes down that post. Because there's a lot of harassment. There was a lot of talk about Wait, women in government. Can I just interrupt you for a second? Sure. If a post, so if you, on say, Instagram, if you see a post, if the post was offensive, then you If the post, post is related to you and it's offensive. Someone posts on your... No, post a picture of you, anything that you don't find acceptable that has your name or, or image. Okay. Um, you just type in hashtag take it down and it's removed. By Meta. Or this yeah, by the meta. computer, by the system, yeah. But they've given the software to every all the um, member countries of the UN because there's a lot of issues with child pornography. So then the, the government ha can have hotlines. They're trying to figure out where the software will automatically find things that are inappropriate, like child pornography. So it would um, be a software that someone would have to put on their machine? or something. No, it, it's it's how the software is, is looping in these social platforms, that the software f will, are, are, they're just creating software so that the their systems can find these things. So the governments can report back, okay, this is the profile that, that we're having a problem with, you know, these okay. kinds of issues, and then they, write the software to, to make it so that it can never be posted in the first place. Because they're having a lot of problems, for example, with women that are in government or in media. Okay. They'll paste their picture on naked bodies and then put it everywhere okay. for harassment, things so like that. I'm and just and curious, general. technically, that yeah. so like in, in a certain country, this certain country, in, within their sort of internet domain, yeah. they would have this software that runs across their internet domain that does this. That right? Yeah, that removes offensive material. Like if it's okay. if it's a naked body of a child. If but it's, someone has to be running this software. It doesn't just. It wasn't clear. They're they're sharing the software right now. Okay. Um, they're making it available public publicly so that um, also NGOs can use it. Okay. So if you're an an NGO that protects children against pornography, you can. Um, you know, work with other agencies and stuff, and, and get the soft, get them the software so that they can. But their goal is to, is to have the the systems on the servers, so not on your computer, but on the on the general server that are you know, because as AI gets more sophisticated, mm -hmm. that they're able to identify what's inappropriate material. So it's not censoring every naked picture on the internet, but if it's you know if the computer can identify that it's a child. Right. That kind of thing. Or and 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 then the you know, because children can't can't aren't supposed to be on Instagram or Facebook or a, a, any of the social platforms really. So so if they're below a certain age, they don't really have a direct way to take those things down. Whereas as an adult you do now. Okay. Yeah. Thanks.
<coughs> yeah, but that's so. But that's in countries where, um, and then they talked about the the uneven distribution of technology, where pretty much in developing countries, the women don't really have access to to computers, phones, internet, electricity <laughs> in a lot of cases. So, um, and and I found that it was interesting. Um, I don't have this idea that um, the whole world needs to look like us. Like that there was one presentation where um, it, it, it was a really great project. They were going into a really remote area in, in, in Malaysia. All the men are off at work. It's just women and girls, and the water was polluted, so they were getting really sick. So they set up this project to clean up the water and have water catchment, and you know, um, a logging operation upstream had had you know, messed up their levees and basically polluted the water. So they restructured their, their farming, everything. And, they, and they, t they came in and taught a group of young women welding so that they could build these catchment facilities. And then they made this statement at the, at the end, and these young women now, now having a trade have gone off to the city to work in welding. Like, that's so great. And I'm looking at the pictures of the women and children that are in the village so happy and enjoying their life, and then I'm looking at the young women in the city, clearly miserable. Mm -hmm. Because they're taken from everything they know, okay, they've got this skill, they can make money now. They're going into a big, horrible, dangerous city, working as women and welding, you know, in a patriarchal situation. <laughs> and, you know, it's the, you know, they just happen to learn that skill, they volunteered to learn it, but is it improving their life? I'm not so sure. So. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I know everybody wants to be helpful, but there's also being aware of the tyranny of helpful people, people that don't don't assume that your lifestyle is what they want for themselves. And, you know, for me, it's it's going if if you're going to do a project, go in and ask them what they want, what they need, and what you can provide, and what they'd like you to butt out of. Also, mm -hmm. I work a lot with indigenous communities, and so. They're very autonomous and don't like a lot of interference, so I'm, I'm hyper aware of that. Um, and I'm actually trying to put a panel together. So next year's theme is women in poverty, and I'm trying to put a panel together of, of um, Native American women from the US and Canada who are gonna speak about poverty in their communities. And again, being really explicit as to how they view that they can heal themselves and and um, come out of poverty, not overlaying our idea of that on them. Um, yeah, so so that's me and kind of what, and, and if you have, um, I can tell you more about the policies, more about specifics, if you have any questions. Um, and I really recommend the Sir Optimus if, you, if you'd like to go to the UN to this conference, because they're a big organization, they're everywhere. You could also join Servos. Um, and so to become a traveler or, or host in Servas, you're vetted. It's a very, it's not like couch surface. You have to have a designated space for people. It's more about somebody coming as a guest, usually from another country, but also from your own country, and kind of sharing your views on things and listening. And I mean, the people tend to be very well traveled and, and involved in other peace organizations. Mm -hmm. But it's, it's a great organization. But um, we are building our our presence at the UN right now. So there is that availability for the conference. I'm in, a, um, I'm in the process of becoming their fifth permanent UN rep for the New York City. Um, yeah, and, um, but as a member, you can also, they have, we have a certain number of slots physically and a certain number of slots online virtually that people can come in and, yeah, because we want the membership to experience it. So, um, and the Sir Optimus being so big and having branches everywhere, that's a really kind of a, a way to get, get active and be able to get to the UN really quickly. And they're, they're probably at every conference there. They were really impressive. Um, the other thing that was really noticeable to, to all of us from Servas is that the US was almost absent at this. There were very few NGOs, Definitely not the government, pretty much absent. Canada, on the other hand, was in everything. Both the government and a ton of NGOs from Canada, very active. 
um, yeah, and I, you know, I have to, I don't really have to ask why, because, you know, we've been in such tumult for the last, you know, period of time in this country, but that's an interesting, and, and there is a, one of the things that the ambassador said was that, you know, growth tends to be cyclical, it tends to be generational, and, um, and that there is, you're seeing this kind of, as the spiral turns, you're, you're seeing this lip of extreme conservatism and fascism globally. It's, it's everywhere. And, um, and he goes, so either you go catch that and go down, or you catch it and, and you're pushed into going forward to saying, no, we're not, we're not going to stay there. And we're going to, so he's like, everything is cyclical. It's, it's, it's interesting how that. So the other thing that I'd like to say about the UN, because this has come up a lot in, in other presentations I've done, is um, people have this idea that the UN is a really ineffectual body, right? That they, you know, too bad that they can't make other countries do things, you know, toe the line. Like, why can't we get Russia to toe the line or whatever? And getting to witness actually how it works. So the UN is not the patriarchal top-down structure. If it was, you would have Star Wars. You would have the Secretary General being all powerful and carrying the biggest stick. It's collaborative. It's the feminine model. It's about everybody having equal voice, equal voice. And, um, and it's also about, very cleverly designed after World War II, to, to its, its function was to prevent another world war from ever happening. And how they do that is they always keep the door open for every member, always, no matter what's happening. They can come in, they can talk, they keep the communication lines open. And, and so I actually think it works quite brilliantly. And, um, and then specifically with UNWomen.org, I got to see you know, all the strengths of the UN where they do amazing studies, they have peacekeeping forces, they, they're, they're super active in women's rights globally, even though they're not, you don't see them on the media, they're not telling their horn, horn but they are everywhere working really hard, really amazing people. Um, and getting to meet some of these people that was just seeing people from all over the world that, yeah, that were really engaged in the potential of humanity, you know, getting out of this, these tendencies that really have to do with fear and scarcity. And how can we um, be a more egalitarian society globally? So. And it's a dance, for sure. But yeah, um, so with the current crisis in Ukraine, I think the number was 8 million, mostly women and children, mm -hmm. mostly women and girls and grandmothers, although half of the grandmothers stayed to fight, very interestingly. Um, they were distributed almost entirely in Europe and Africa. So. Yeah, and that was on top of, there's been a lot of unrest in various uh, regions. Um, we, we had a parallel event with our, um, we have a peace school in Turkey, so we had the peace secretary from our Turkey branch speak, and two Afghanistan refugee women. And it was so moving, I want to cry just thinking about it. Um, and I haven't been, I've been to Turkey four times, amazingly beautiful country, but I haven't been there in about 15 years. And uh, the changes in the last 10 years are quite shocking. And the secretary was talking about not only the school was damaged in the earthquake and we lost several service members in the earthquake. So she was, you know, we got the to the minute update on what was happening on the ground. But she was also talking about people that are fleeing Turkey over to Greece, like in, in little plastic poles for, kitty poles, like whatever they can try to float. And she said something really powerful. She said, the only reason the mother puts a child in a boat is that if the water is safer than the land. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's the reality. Um, so there's a lot of work to be done. But um, yeah, it was great to see so many, so many powerful women and men, probably about 15% of the conference were men. They were amazing human beings. Yeah, great allies. So, um, yeah. So, questions? Any? Want to know anything specifically? Are you from New York? No, I'm from San Francisco originally, and um, I live in Vermont now. 
Oh, you well, you talked about being a New York representative. Yeah. So because I'm on the East Coast, I could get I have friends that I can stay with. And so the great thing about Servos too, because there's hosting. So whenever any of us go to a conference, there are you know ten hosts in the New York area. So you stay with the host. Yeah. So I had dinner with my host the last day before I left because I was you know hitting the ground and running for the conference. Um, but we did have dinner, and, and she she was from China and. Her daughter is a is a conductor for operas. She had worked in, in Strasbourg for years, but she had dinner with us, and yeah, so we got to hear her story and how she came to serve us. And yeah. What do you? What is the most urgent need for women globally now? I mean, was there a, uh, sort of a situation of that, and then so safety, and then how like women and was, there, was there any kind of you know? discussion about how to support that? Um, yes, there were many discussions on how to support that. So one of the studies, because you know that's one of the things that the, that the UN Women.org does, um, talked about, so I, I, I went to all the indigenous panels, but I also went to um, some of the panels on the continent of Africa, and statistically during COVID, violence against women went way up and also genital mutilation. Oh, They've been working on that for years. Yeah. It's, it's, the numbers are, they were almost gone and now they're way up again. So, um, yeah, they're trying to understand, you know, they're going into the communities trying to figure out why this is the case. Well, obviously you're home, you're frustrated, you're broke, you're scared, and you're taking it out on whoever you can, I guess, physically. So one of our members from Servas is actually a UN delegate from Rwanda, Fidel, he is amazing. And he did a whole presentation. He's involved in a couple of different men's organizations in Africa, because most of Africa has a very patriarchal structure. And, and he actually showed a beautiful film where these organizations, they go in, he's gone into several countries, not just Rwanda. And they educate the men about um, the collaborative model of um, society, of, you know, of, of how to honor, um, and, and how they do it is because you see in the African continent, when there's any crisis, the women take over and take charge and get things done, floods, famines, whatever. And so they, that's kind of, that was an interesting point of entry, like, because there was always examples where, where, where they can see, see how they really are the foundation of your society. I and get that in about indigenous women yeah. worldwide. Yeah, worldwide. And um, it's true, worldwide. And um, and anyway, so they actually come in and do um, courses with the men. And you see the men at the end enjoying, like, helping raising the babies and actually enjoying their family instead of having this, because, you know, it's like the men hang out with the men and the women hang out with the women, right? And, and having a more kind of circular community model. And it's been super successful. Wow. So he did a whole presentation on that, it was brilliant. So I actually posted on my Facebook page, do I have a link to that? I hope I did, I, I think I did. I also have a link to the, to the parallel event, the, the recording of it, um, mm -hmm. the parallel event mm -hmm. with, with the Peace Secretary of uh, Tur Turkey, it's Turkai now, Turkai Servos. And, um, and the Afghanistani women. And um, the, Afghani, the Afghani refugees have been, you know, they talked about the whole process of being a refugee, refugee and migrating and how they went, you know, to this one country and then they were sent to this other country and now they're finally settled in the third country. And it's the children learning all three languages. And, and the parents being like, what do we do? Like, we can't speak a language. Um, but they also have, you know, friends and family still in Afghanistan, so they could actually also tell us about, yeah, Afghanistan and Iran, I saw a lot of, um, a lot of uh, meetings with people who are, like, Iran, there's a whole block on their internet now, they, they're, and they're trying to get around. So that's another thing where technology can help, and this is what um, Elon Musk's chain did with Ukraine, he put all these satellites right over the country, so when, Russia shot out their internet, they still have internet access. So you can actually do these, you know, global satellites in areas where they're restricting 
access, so they're looking mm -hmm. into that. Yeah. Um, yeah, because the internet is on lockdown in Iran you now. He's a very problematic. Can't yes, really depend on him for one. <laughs> no, but he's not the only one. He's, he, he was actually required to do it. It, it wasn't an act of egalitarianism on his part. It, it was. It was not a request. It was a. Oh, they yeah. made it. Yeah. I have a question about. And they made him keep it there as well. <laughs> yeah. Do you want to go No, go free. So, if the U.S. wasn't sort of engaging very much, right, as an entity, were there? You know, um, was there a conversation about what was going on in the U.S.? None. And so, you know, because we were delegates from the U.S., we had the conversation of, like, what's going on here? Mm -hmm. Why is the U.S. absent? Like, it was really disconcerting. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. are people assuming that we don't have problems? We have lots of problems. Mm -hmm. We have problems with, yeah, p poverty, access to, 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 to technology, violence against women, all of those problems we have in space in the U.S. So. Um, so that's how we got to the conversation of, well, maybe next year we actually talk about the U.S. Yeah. At, like, our organization. That would be good. Yeah. Yeah. Um, there's, there's another, um, some of the delegates from Europe also want to do a presentation. But as it turns, you know, so we're finding out. So we can actually do more than one. So that's like the Seroptimus did a gazillion. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a fee for if it's online or in person, but that's fine. So, so yeah, so we're getting more, more active and looking at, you know, projects that we're personally involved in and, and how to use the UN platform to let everyone know about it. Where would you go when you look for statistics? Like if you're looking for... Go to unwomen.org. Okay. Because they're, they're really the arm in terms of um, rights of women mm -hmm. that are. But, you know, there were so many panels. There were hundreds of panels a day. So there were panels that were all about the legalities. There were panels that were planning panels. There were panels that were um, stories like it, 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 and, and studies. And so whatever you wanted to find out in whatever capacity you could, mm. it was all there. Was everything recorded? Um, no, because it's a summit, they do not record it. So the virtual, that was the other great thing about, because the virtual ones were recorded. Yeah. By the nature of them being on Zoom, they could easily. Um, there is UN TV, so some of the presentations were recorded. The celebration of International Women's Day, I think, was the opening statement of the Secretary General. A few of his statements were um, recorded, and they were amazing. He's an amazing Secretary General. Um, and then I, I'm forgetting, I, there were, I met so many people and there were so many names and the names of the speakers, like I had to take notes, but um, the head of the UNWomen.org is who runs the Commission on Status of Women. The Secretary General just attends like the rest of the delegates and, and has, has podium time, but he's not running the show, she is, appropriately. <laughs> yeah. But it, but it is the second biggest event of the UN calendar, so um, there are thousands of people there from all oh, over the okay. world. Yeah, it's a big deal. And, um, you know, because they said it's 50% it's, it's of the population, you know, this is Women? urgent. More, isn't it more? Yeah, I said, I think it's more, and uh, yeah, but um, they said they were generalizing. It's like if half the world is having these issues because of the other half of the world, like, we need to do something about it. So um, I'm just going to read you um, our peace secretary for this country, Yossi, did, did filed a, a report. The, the gender digital divide, um, it's, it's just a, a little backstory of this particular focal point. In 1995, the Beijing Declaration and Platform for Action embodied the commitment of the international community to achieve gender equality. They examine women's issues in relation to the environment, violence, the economy, institutional mechanisms, which we looked at a lot, armed conflict, human rights, education, poverty, power, health, media, and more. The declaration stressed that women should not only benefit from technology, but also participate in technology across various critical areas, including education, employment, and communication. In 2020, at the Declaration's 25th anniversary review and appraisal, gender gaps were recognized, and the General Assembly called on states 
to set priori priorities to promote gender inclusion um, in technological development and innovation, which was the topic of this summit. Right? Member states pledged to harness the potential of technology and innovation to improve women's and girls' lives and to close the developmental divide and digital divide, including the gender digital divide, as well as addressing the risks and challenges emerging from use of technologies. So that's really what it was about. Um, how technology is rapidly transforming some societies, excluding others, what problems are arising because of it, and what to do about them. How much did you feel like this is the cynical part between like Meta or whoever, yeah. or whatever group putting things were, you know, putting the shine on and making things sound better? I mean, obviously, yeah, things no, are dire. Yeah, obviously things are dire. But kind of like, hey, this is our innovation. Like I was on a recently on a call listening to um, about technology for diagnosing and treating like women's health mm -hmm. in developing nations. And it was fascinating. Mm -hmm. We were like, okay, nobody said anything, like, there wasn't a lot of downside talked about, aside from that there's a problem that we need to address. And then all of the ways they were trying to address yeah, it yeah, were we positive. Yeah, we talked about too much, actually, yeah. I think. It was, for, it could be like, okay, I'm here for innovation and solutions. <laughs> like, I'm a think tanker, that's kind of what I'm good at. So, so I'm like, okay, let's talk about avenues, creative avenues avenues to change this scenario. That's what I want, you know. So so the um, parallel events and the meetups were really crucial for that, because that's when we actually, we, had, we were free to talk to anybody and could really connect. Um, no, you know, I'm not a big fan of Meta personally, but um, they have a responsibility because they own several social media platforms, and they were asked to have some involvement you know, because the governments have been asking them to solve what's going on on their platforms. And they're starting to pass laws to require them to solve it. And so they were presenting what the solutions were and also um, where digitalization is going in, in, in terms of schooling. But I'll tell you what my takeaway was. You think, oh, you know, you're, you're going to have AI in the distant corners of Malaysia teaching kids, you know on a computer, it's not happening. Because that's not how we're built as humans. And my big takeaway was, it all has to do with relationships, all of it. So you as a person talking to one other person or a group or a country, you know, it all has to do with relationships. Going in with projects, it's about the people you know and the relationships you develop, and that's the whole foundation of Serva, so we were right at home there, but, but um, that's how anything gets done by humanity, is person to person or person to group of persons. And, and so it wasn't, you know, big shiny meta doing this, it was, it was like, hey, I invented this, it's so cool, the person that actually came up with it standing there going, this is how it works. You know, I just came up with it, and you know, we're we're trying to figure out what to do next, and then, you know, we're trying to keep up, keep ahead of these. You know, the dark force is the way they see it, and and these are all like, I mean, Meta is mostly like they're twenty somethings. They're they're yeah, the people that are innovating in Meta, they're they're super young. They're right out of college. They're on fire, um, and um, and they're the people that are going to be changing the world through their relationships, but even whether it's the delegates on the floor, it's also they're cultivating relationships with each other and by that relationships for the countries. That's what they're doing. But so. how does how does that totally I agree like with so many of our problems and so much just of our lives is that relational piece, right? We yeah. know that. And as you say on whatever level, but right and that is counterbalanced. The UN is not glossy, I can tell you that. There was no glossing over anything. In fact, all the warts were hanging out. Um, what I would say was my personal observation. So being in the General Assembly, everyone, every member goes through and has a speech, right? So you could tell, because they all basically had to report on what they were doing about it. Like, it was accountability, right? So, and we already knew what they were doing about it because we have the report, <laughs> or not doing about it. So the countries that were not meeting the requirements, 
when they would get up and read. So you could totally tell the difference between the person who loved their job, who was there, who was passionate, who believed in what they were doing, and the person that was representing this government who was not stepping up. And they were reading a pre-written statement by someone else about how great they are. And we're just all like, you know, like, OK, next. Like, we know that that's total BS. And uh, there was that. But that was the only place you saw it, was in the General Assembly. They were required to, you know, pre-written speeches from their government. And, um, you know, but that's not where, every, where anything real happens other than voting. It, it's, it's what they're talking about at lunch, and the, they have their own you know, cafeteria, and um, it, yeah, how they're, how they're sitting down together, that's where it really happens. Mm -hmm. And then we got to participate in that in, in the meetups, so. And a lot of the meetups were like, okay, this, this NGO, we're here from so-and-so, so, so, and we have this evening free from six to seven, let's just all meet across the street and talk, and yeah, you just go over and, you know, and introduce yourselves. We had, we went to, um, I'm trying to remember the exact wording of it. It was like the Turkey House or something, Turkey House. It, it, it had a very friendly name, but it was basically the consulate of Turkey. And it was like being in a James Bond film. It was, as one of my fellow delegates was, was like, the theater was palpable. And like, it was a very strange experience. Also, the cleanest place I've ever been in my life. Like, you could lick the floors in the, ba in the bathroom. Like, it, it was sparklingly clean. It literally looked like a film set for, for 007. Like, it was, I was waiting for James Bond to appear. But, but it, it, was, um, it was a meetup that was put together by a group of women entre entrepreneurs from Turkey. And they, they were all Islamic. They were all um, wearing the hijab. And we actually had a conversation about the hijab, which, which was great. They're like, we don't get what the big deal is, because, you know, women used to always, you know, they used to have scars, they used to always, everyone used to cover their heads, men and women, and, and we, we still do it, and, you know, and, um, you know, we talked about different religions and how, I mean, I was raised Catholic, and you used to have to have a little doily, you know, or a little covering on your head, and it has to do about quieting your own information so you can listen to a higher power, right? And so we had this whole conversation about that, and then they went into all their excitement, so, so one of them had started a startup making really pretty hijabs, like colorful. <laughs> oh, it's just doing really well, as you can imagine, because there's a lot of Islamic women. Um, but yeah, they were all pretty young and really excited about you know, possibilities of the future of, of, of women and, and, and sharing with women from other countries. So there were women from about 20 countries at that meetup. Mm -hmm. And um, they got to make connections for their businesses, mm -hmm. and it was literally a business meetup. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it, it ran the gamut. It was, it was but yeah, no, I, there, there was way more authenticity than I had expected. Um, yeah, honest conversations. Yeah, and, and that was the exception in the, in the General Assembly with the speeches, the canned speeches. Yeah. I'd like to ask you to talk about fascism around the world, and I'm not sure even what to ask you to talk about exactly. Um, um, but yes. Maybe you do. So um, the only, I, I mean, it came up a lot, but the only conversation I had about it was specifically with the ambassador from Sweden to Yemen, you know, about, you know, people that have been here for generations see how cyclical things are, you know, financial, uh, global, um, political, there's, there are these cycles that we as humanity go through of leap bounce, or you could say the pendulum swings, like we get maybe too liberal and, and the world becomes Vegas, and then we're like, mm, you know, and you start to swing the other way. And there's always some people holding the poles, and most people are in the middle at most times, you know. But governments, there, there are these kickbacks. What we talk about more, which I think is more topical, is how to get more women in politics. Because you know, this year we lost two female prime ministers: the, the prime minister from New Zealand, the prime minister from Scotland, both because they wanted their life back. Mm -hmm. And that was pretty much the consensus: like women, when they have a family, have this conflict because they want some normalcy of life that politics, in particular for their kids, that politics does not provide at all. I mean, the hours are long, you're usually nowhere in your home. You know, and you can't 
pack your kids up and, you know, it's, well, I mean, unless you're living in a consulate, <laughs> which you can't, but uh, otherwise. So, you know, but that's the challenge where they, you know, uh, in Europe, they, they have a lot of young women coming up, getting involved in politics, but when they, they start to have children, they drop out, and it's because yes. they can't carry both of them because politics is like a, you know, sometimes a 24-7 job, it's not a regular job. And, um, and how to, you know, creative solutions for that, like, um, I mean, in Europe, they're really um, looking at, which I love, gender, gender equity as considering both, you know, all genders and all fluidity of gender. So, for example, in Sweden, they have new family leave, and um, the woman or the man can take it or both. They can split it however it works for their family, but they consider that everybody in the family should be able to help raise the baby. Um, and you know, and, and, and how to have um, childcare accessible in, in workplaces. So they're doing that, but um, in government, it's harder if, if you're you know, <coughs> you're not. It's like you know, those people don't have breaks. It's like if you're at lunch, you're at a lunch meeting. Like you, you're never not, you know, you're never not on. Like it's a particular type of life. And it's so important because, so um, one of the interesting panels I went to for the indigenous people was the Pacific Rim. And they've completely embraced technology and they had a whole different scenario. So it was just interesting to see like, really it's all choice. I, I mean, so um, so this is like Tuvalu, Cooks Island, um, Samoa, um, and there's one other one I'm talking about, Tonga. Um, and so Tuvalu, when, I, I don't know what, the, what they're called, but like .com, .net, .org, right, whatever that end acronym means, they purchased .tv, because Tuvalu, right, TV, right? And that has led them in this whole path because now anybody that wants that, they pay Tuvalu. So, so, so Tuvalu had all this money all of a sudden. They, they, were, they had a very basic society and all of a sudden they, you know, they were wired into technology. So they put towers in, they put you know, all the stuff. So all the islands have high speed internet and you know, they're in the middle of the Pacific and they have all this technology because Tuvalu was rich from their dot TV. And they said in, in their society, um, so then they have all these scholarships for education and stuff, so all the girls are going to school and becoming the doctors and the lawyers. So they said actually in our society, it's reversed where the men tend to stay at home and they're doing the manual labor and the women all have higher education. And so they're leaving, a lot of them are leaving because you know they go to New Zealand to get an education and then they stay, you know, they meet people there, whatever. Um, so, so they're trying to figure out how to have some of them come back and help the society. But their big problem is they're going to be underwater in 50 years. Yeah. So they're looking at their water rights because they have huge water rights around the island. Mm -hmm. And so they're, because of DOT TV, they're, they're a member of the UN. Um, and so they're able to advocate for um, being able to keep the water rights when the land is under, underwater because usually that's that and how their, their entire society is going to be refugees. So that was the conversation. Mm -hmm. But that, with that in mind, a lot of people are just not coming back. They're going to get educated because they're probably all going to go to New Zealand, Australia anyway. Mm -hmm. It's the closest. But, um, but they were, um, there were, um, so, so the head of, um, which I, I think he was help, help in something. Um, he had a very long name, but they abbreviated it to, to Mr. IT, which is good. <laughs> he was hysterical. But all the other reps from the Pacific Rim were women. And they talked about how in their society the grandmothers rule. And you know, there was even uh, a grandmother from Hawaii, from the Hawaiian administration, okay, from the tr tribal. Um, yeah, and so it was a whole different conversation to see these super powerful women and this this man saying, the only reason I'm in the office is because the women don't want to be, like we keep losing them because they're, it's too hard. Yeah, but it, it was, that was a very, just, 
turned everything on its head. Mm -hmm. You know, different choices, different scenario. Um, yeah, that's good to learn about. Yeah, and for them, that was their, it's just interesting, that was their solution, and it's created certain gifts and certain problems, mm -hmm. you know? So. Well, thank you so much. Yeah.